So welcome back uh, uh, for our second panel. Uh, the, the first panel gave us an excellent overview of the many localized security and human rights challenges facing the Horn of Africa. For our next session, uh, we're going to take a more global perspective on the region. Uh, the Horn of Africa has emerged as a new locus of competition for the Gulf, Egypt, Turkey, and other actors. This panel will assess the actors and their objectives and what this competition might mean for regional stability. War in Yemen has exacerbated tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, their rivalry has spilled over into the Horn of Africa. The UAE is aggressively expanding its reach into the Red Sea littoral, using its position in Aden, as well as its longstanding relationship with Djibouti as stepping stones. But its links to Djibouti are now being challenged uh, by encroachment from China. Turkey's foreign policy has adopted a more comprehensive program of aid packages, investment, and diplomacy, especially in Somalia, which has become an arena of rivalry between Turkey and Qatar on the one hand and Saudi Arabia and the UAE on the other. With a transition in Sudan, an Eritrean Ethiopian rapprochement, and increased investment from the EU, China, and India, as well as uh, the others uh, into the Horn, what can we expect from the historically insular region as it opens up to trade and diplomacy. Uh, I'm going to moderate uh, this esteemed panel of experts. And so, uh, first, uh, let me introduce Alana Delosier. Uh, Alana is a research fellow in the Bernstein Program on Gulf and Energy Policy at WINEP, where she specializes in nuclear weapons and proliferation, counterterrorism, and Gulf politics. Uh, particularly in Yemen and Saudi Arabia. She spent seven years in the Middle East in both the Levant and the Gulf, uh, where she worked as a political analyst and spearheaded training programs for new analysts. Uh, we're also delighted to have with us uh, on this panel Yasmin Farouk. Uh, Yasmin is a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Her previous research and publications cover Egyptian and Saudi foreign policies, international relations in the Arab world, and social participation in policy and constitution making. Prior to joining Carnegie, for, uh, Yasmin was based in Egypt, where she taught political science. From 2016 to 2017, she was a director of research at, Carnegie, at the Cairo International Center for Conflict Resolution, Peacekeeping, and Peacebuilding, a think tank and training center affiliated with the Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Also joining us today is MEI's Ganul Toll, who is freshly returned from a writing sabbatical in Italy. Uh, Ganul is the founding director of MEI Center for Turkish Studies. Uh, she is also an adjunct professor at George Washington University's Institute for Middle East Studies. After three years of research in Germany and the Netherlands, she wrote her dissertation on the radicalization of the Turkish Islamist movement, Mili Gorus, in Western Europe. And finally, joining us today from Boston University is Michael Woldemariam. Uh, Michael's teaching and research interests focus on African politics, particularly the dynamics of armed conflict, the behavior of rebel organizations, and self-determination movements, and post-conflict institution building. Uh, his special ex expertise is on the Horn of Africa region, where he's traveled extensively and conducted field work. His first book, Insurgent Fragmentation in the Horn of Africa, Rebellion and Its Discontents, was released by Cambridge University Press in 2018. Uh, with those introductions, let's uh, dig into some of the issues. And I'm going to turn uh, first to Alana. Uh, and ask how you would describe the calculus and operations of Gulf countries, especially the UAE, in the Horn of Africa. Can you expand on their role and the destabilizing or stabilizing effect they may have on the region? And in particular, I know that you've recently been to the region. 
So uh, your thoughts about the migration issue, which came up in our first panel uh, while you were out there. Ivana? Thank you. Thank you all so much for, uh, for having me. Uh, so to start uh, with talking about the golf, and I'll end on the migration issue. Uh, so, oh, there it comes. <laughs> OK. Uh, <laughs> So uh, to start with the Gulf issue, and then I'll, I'll end on the migration issue, I think the, the way that the UAE specifically is thinking about uh, the Red Sea and the area between the Gulf and the Horn. So, so we all have seen, I mean, this, this event is a clear example of where Gulf-Horn relationships are becoming much uh, more central to discussions in DC. It started as a slow sort of percolation, and now there's there's a lot of people thinking about these issues and for good reason. So I went to Ethiopia in December uh, and attended a conference that was very, that was almost entirely uh, African officials. And so I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a Gulf analyst, not uh, an East Africa analyst. And so I kind of got their side of the story. Uh, and I've tried to piece that together. Uh, and so I'll share with you what, what I've basically pieced together. And then of course the other panelists will fill in um, uh, and add their own uh, thoughts as well. So for the UAE specifically, I think there's oftentimes a little bit of a misnomer that you know, we see the UAE's presence around the, uh, around the Red Sea and then south of it as well, and it immediately seems you know, threatening or there must be some sort of you know, plan in the background or something. I do think that there's a plan, but I'm not so sure that it should be perceived at least uh, that, that they don't, they, they are not trying to be perceived as threatening. I think that the UAE has a couple of reasons for, the, for why they're sort of moving some of their attention to the Red Sea area. And I would say that that falls into three categories. One is military, one is security, outside of military specifically, and the third is economic. Um, so there's, the first point I would make is as the US is withdrawing from the region, at least psychologically, I think there's a real impression in the Gulf that they don't know where that ends. So when I arrived in the UAE in 2011, it was already a topic of conversation among Emirati officials that, uh, that the US was seemed to be withdrawing. And this was, of course, under Obama. Now we're under a totally different president, and that sense still exists. And so I think the Gulf states are basically thinking it's, it's our responsibility or potentially our responsibility in the future to protect our own western flank. They've always been interested in protect, protecting the eastern flank of the Arabian Peninsula because the Strait of Hormuz is there. We all know the threats to the Strait of Hormuz, great. But what about the western side? What about the Bab al-Mandeb or even the Suez? Who's protecting those? Um, the Yemen war has complicated this a bit because the Houthis have sent missiles into the Red Sea previously. They did damage a Saudi tanker uh, at one point and that the Saudis actually temporarily halted their supplies. Uh, and so even before the pipeline attacks, you know, a week or so ago, uh, there was already a concern in the Red Sea. Now the pipeline attacks, which of course, the, so the Houthis attacked the pipelines in Saudi Arabia, those pipelines were going to the Red Sea. They were not pipelines going to the Strait of Hormuz side of the country, they were going to the Red Sea side of the country. And so there's a real security concern uh, in the Red Sea that didn't exist before. That coupled with the US potentially maybe pulling out, we're not sure, I think that's uh, making the Saudis and the Emiratis really look at protecting their own western flank. Uh, in addition, the UAE is always, you know, in addition, there's the Yemen war, and so there's that military aspect. So they had uh, a relationship with Djibouti that apparently uh, dissolved over uh, some sort of issue on the tarmac, uh, and they moved their base to Eritrea, to Assab. And so there is a military base, you know, in the Horn of Africa. Uh, there's differing reports on whether that base will continue to exist after the Yemen war, we shall see. Depends on which side, of, side you ask. But I think that, again, so if you look at the Red Sea, the UAE actually has access to, and I use that very specifically, access to a series of either military bases or ports. I think it's like six. It's a lot. Uh, and so you look at that and you think, what's going on here? But I think it's really just the military dis discussion that I just suggested 
really wanting to pay attention to the security threat. And then lastly, I would say the economic piece. The, if you look at a map of China's One Belt, One Road, it doesn't go to Dubai. If you haven't noticed that, I can promise you the Emiratis have. And so if One Belt, One Road is the future of trade, or it might be the future of trade, I think the Emiratis realize that they need to get in that game. They're very good at logistics. DP World is you know, world-renowned port logistics you know, that we all know in DC because of the crisis in, I think, 2006, right? Uh, but you know, this is something that they know that they're good at or they think that they're good at. And so they've opened up a number of ports in the Red Sea as well. And I think that's part of an objective to be a part of, you know, the future of trade. And then lastly, I would just add that the Ethiopia-Eritrea uh, peace agreement recently, um, you know, that means that Ethiopia may have more access now to world markets, which go through, of course, the Red Sea. So if the UAE kind of gets in on that, or the Saudis get in on that, you know, that's a huge market. Uh, so it already, of course, comes out through Djibouti, but if the Ethiopians have additional access to ports and can sell more and buy more, um, then that's a real opportunity as well. So I think there's a lot of different things that are kind of coming together to paint the picture of the UAE in the Red Sea right now. Uh, but um, it's, not quite, it's not quite so simple as looking at a map and seeing the UAE dot everywhere and thinking what's going on. I think it's actually pretty clear exactly what's going on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alana. And, and Yasmin, let's, let's pick up on some of the points that uh, Alana was making. And, and if you could talk specifically uh, about uh, where the Saudi perspective is, as well as the Egyptian uh, perspective on, on uh, some of these issues, and how those two uh, countries in particular look at, look at the, uh, the, the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa within the context of their global and their regional, but also their domestic policies. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I think uh, we're talking here, when you talk about Egypt and Saudi Arabia, you're probably talking about the traditional powers that usually were the Arab faces that you know the Horn of Africa countries usually saw. And um, these, were two, these are two countries who, um, since a long time, since the independence movement and decolonization, uh, with Saudi Arabia, especially since the oil money became abandoned, were the first to extend uh, their influence. But it has always been an influence that is um, a reaction to a threat. Uh, it's it, the, their policies in the Horn of Africa were always aligned on their policies elsewhere. So you saw their interventions, for example, if you talk about Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia's intervention began in our presence, let's say. It was not really an interventionism like the one we're seeing right now. But it began, for example, uh, we began to see this in, with the creation of the State of Israel first, when Israel started reaching out to the countries of the Horn of Africa and the rest of Africa, to be honest, uh, to create international relations. You've seen reactions from Arab countries, of course, from Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And then when you came to what is called in the literature the Arab Cold Wars between Egypt and Saudi Arabia, you saw also also the Horn of Africa becoming one of the scenes where uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt try to influence those countries. Uh, and in, in really in every wave of big threats to those countries, they transferred their competition and their conflict or their cooperation to the Horn of Africa uh, and to the Red Sea region. Um, and uh, it's, it was, I, I, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but it was never a relation of partnership, really. Uh, to me, if you talk especially about Saudi Arabia and the Gulf with the Horn of Africa, to me, it's really a tale of two curses, a country that has a lot of money and that immediately thinks about money as a tool to intervene. Uh, and this is basically what Saudi Arabia has done, and this is why a lot of its political influence has been short-lived and has been in competition with other countries that either have also money or have something else to offer to those countries. And it's the same for other countries intervening right now, except for, uh, for the Emirates, for example, that has a more strategic and long-term vision for its presence in the Horn of Africa. But if you think about the Qatari competition with Saudi Arabia, for example, it's also through the use of money, which makes a lot of the political initiatives also short-lived. Uh, and this has been the curse on the side of Saudi Arabia, that until today it's, it's very reactive, it's not part of a strategic vision. Uh, the other side, um, 
it, it, to Egypt too, it's a curse of, of, of a geography of the Horn. It's, this is where the Nile water comes from. This is where a lot of the threats, the transnational threats come from. And uh, this is part of the Red Sea, which is really a lifeline for the Egyptian economy and for world maritime trade. So again, it was seen as an area where threats come from and where every time Egypt is uh, always wanted to maintain a hegemonic position. On the other side, it's another curse, which is the curse simply of the geography and of their situation and of countries that did not necessarily develop any other asset more than this geographical uh, position that is actually, and the countries are using this in playing international and regional powers against each other. There hasn't really been a development of another main source of income in those countries. And thus, this is why I see it as, as really a tale of two curses that makes them link together. Uh, now, I would be uh, uh, cautious to say that um, in the previous panel, I heard the word that the, the, the one side, what happens on one side shapes what happened on the other. Uh, I really don't see it this way because those two geographical units um, have never seen each other as part of one. Uh, the, yes, they are all around the Red Sea, but the Red Sea is an area that very early become internationalized. So those country, countries had very limited space to what they could do together because there were always so many uh, international interests of very powerful countries at stake. Um, um, I think um, right now, in terms of the domestic politics of Saudi Arabia and, and Egypt, the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia is becoming more and more highly important in, in the domestic politics because of Vision 2030, right? A big chunk of Vision 2030, a lot, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars are allocated to projects north of the Red Sea. Uh, so whether Neom or the Red Sea Touristic Resort Project, and these are directly linked to the legitimacy of the new Crown Prince. So the Red Sea is becoming something that is uh, highly important and sensitive to Saudi Arabia, and this is why we saw Saudi Arabia in, uh, having this new initiative of the Red Sea and Horn of Africa entity that um, I can talk about the details <laughs> later, that is in competition with really the Egyptian vision. This is not, has, hasn't been going very smoothly. Uh, also, you could see a direct competition between Egypt and Saudi Arabia that emerged since 2016 when there were talks uh, about uh, giving the two islands of Tehran and Sanafir to Saudi Arabia, also on the Red Sea, and they got in a final court decision in 2018 of those two countries being annexed uh, to or restituted to Saudi Arabia, which is in direct link of Saudi Arabia's new orientation of relations with Israel, which is also another actor very important around the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa that we, I don't see a lot talked about uh, when we're discussing those issues right now. I'll stop here and... Great. Thank you, Yasmin. And that was uh, really uh, very interesting. And let's, let's talk about uh, one of the other major players in, in the region right now, and that's Turkey. And Turkey has certainly... Uh, to a certain extent, uh, um, exercised lira diplomacy, uh, particularly in terms of its investments in Somalia and its standing in Somalia. But also, as, as Yasmin said, uh, the Turks bring something else to the table as well in, in terms of their engagement with, uh, with uh, the Horn. So, uh, Gadul, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, Horn of Africa is not high on Turkey's foreign policy agenda. And yet still, it's, it's a very important region for uh, Turkey's regional vision and, and interest in the region. region. But I think what is Turkey doing in the Horn of Africa should be seen as part of uh, Turkey's larger uh, Africa policy. Uh, the ruling party launched an, an African opening in 2005. Um, in an effort to cultivate closer ties uh, with, with the, the countries in the region. Um, and I think the primary, it was primarily driven by economic considerations. But also the ruling party, I, I think part of that was um, an effort to diver diversify uh, Turkey's traditional Western-oriented foreign policy. So the aim in Africa was to build on uh, existing regional uh, educational uh, and, and economic networks uh, and, and expand the, uh, Turkey's influence in the region. Um, and Turkey used soft power instruments uh, to achieve that aim, such as humanitarian aid, uh, development aid. Uh, Turkey opened uh, several embassies in, in Africa. Turkish airlines launched direct flights to 
uh, places like Somalia, for instance. So Turkey became a very active uh, player uh, in the region, and I think what uh, Turkey is doing in the, reg in, in the Horn of Africa and neighboring countries should be seen as part of, uh, of that strategy. But I think, um, so primarily, Turkey's policy vis-a-vis -vis the Horn of Africa was um, driven by economic considerations, but now Turkey's actions are motivated by um, this larger competition over regional influence, particularly after uh, the Gulf crisis in, in, uh, in 2017. So I think that was a critical moment, and that changed how Turkey sees uh, the region and, and, and the neighboring countries. Uh, and, and Turkey sees its role there as, as, as an important role, uh, particularly to counterbalance uh, what Egypt is doing, or counterbalance the Saudi or the UAE policy um, uh, there. But as Yasin said, uh, Turkey is playing a much more nuanced role uh, than the Gulf countries, uh, I think. In Somalia, for instance, um, Turkey is using all soft power instruments, including uh, religion, as, as a soft power tool. In 2011, uh, President Erdogan uh, visited uh, Mogadishu, uh, and that was uh, during a devastating famine, and he was accompanied by a large uh, delegation of civil society organizations, humanitarian organizations, singers. Uh, so I think it started as, um, as a humanitarian initiative, but it grew into a, a state-building project. Uh, if you look at what Turkey is doing today uh, in, in Somalia, for instance, it's not only opening uh, schools, providing humanitarian aid, uh, development aid, uh, but it also has a military facility that is training uh, Somali soldiers there. Um, and Turkish firms are administering uh, ports, seaports, and, and airports in, in Somalia, so its role in that country has, has, has um, grown in, in the last um, few years, which I think is, is very significant. And even uh, Turkey appointed a special envoy uh, for Somalia, which is, uh, which is a first in, in Turkish foreign policy. Uh, and that is to basically uh, to restart the mediation efforts between uh, Somalia and the breakaway region of, of Soma Somaliland. Uh, so Turkey is playing a much larger role. And if you look at the neighboring countries like Sudan, for instance, Turkey has, a, um, has become very active. Uh, in 2017, for instance, Turkey and Sudan signed um, a dozen agreements. Uh, and those agreements uh, included a pledge by, by Turkey to restore uh, Suakin Island, for instance. And that is a major problem for, for the Gulf countries uh, because Turkish uh, media report uh, that, that Turkey is planning to uh, build a, a military base uh, there. The Sudan is, is denying the reports. Um, but also, so the, I think uh, what Turkey is trying to do with Sudan is not only boost economic and, and trade ties, but also military ties. Uh, and at the same time using uh, religious networks that were built by uh, like Gulenist organizations and uh, Gulenist they had a, still have a large presence in Africa and that's how uh, the, the ruling party decided to launch this African initiative. Now they are considered a terrorist organization but now so the government is trying to use that network uh, and and build a friendly religious network with, with local uh, religious leaders. And so that is, that is significant. And, it, and Ethiopia uh, also, Turkey has been, uh, its, uh, its investments, it's been relatively less visible, um, but uh, its commercial investments uh, outweigh those in, both in Sudan and, and in, in Somalia. But some in Turkey uh, are proposing, uh, they're promoting closer ties with Ethiopia. Uh, because they think that Turkey could use that as a leverage against Egypt, for instance. Uh, and President Erdogan recently said that he, he might visit Ethiopia uh, soon. And Djibouti is, um, uh, uh, Turkey has made modest uh, investments um, there. But when you talk about what Turkey uh, is, is doing in, in the Horn of Africa, uh, 
it's really, the Gulf countries are worried about Turkey's actions. Um, they're arguing that, that this is a quest for a new Ottoman uh, revival. But I think those uh, fears are, are overblown uh, because uh, Turkey has much bigger foreign and, and domestic uh, problems. Uh, and particularly important is, uh, is Turkish economy. It's officially in, in the recession now. Uh, and what Turkey can do in the larger region as well as in the Horn of Africa will be limited by um, what's happening domestically, especially on the economic front. Great. Thank you, Ganul. Um, and, and so uh, turning to you, Michael, uh, of course, from uh, Havana, uh, Yasmin, and Ganul, we, we've looked at the region from the outside in. And if I could ask you to turn it around and look at it from the inside out, what is the perspective of the states of the Horn of Africa about uh, these, um, uh, these uh, foreign interests and, and interventions? And how do the states of the Horn of Africa see um, their ability to continue to exercise their own agency, their own uh, ability for self-determination in the face of this increasing international competition? Sure. Um, so <clears throat> let me just sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that, but let me sort of make one sort of prior observation building on, on, on the points that have been made by my fellow panelists. I mean, I think if you, if you have any sort of historical uh, perspective on the Horn of Africa and sort of its evolution in the post-colonial period, um, the sort of present pattern of MENA engagement, sort of spillover of MENA conflict into the Horn region isn't actually really that new. There's something oddly familiar uh, about what's going on. Um, so, you know, the Arab-Israeli conflict spilled over into the Horn, conflict and rivalry between um, con uh, conservative and more radical Arab states, right? These spilled over into the Horn and, and shape outcomes in that particular region, right? But I think certainly from the perspective of Horn countries, there's a few things that are new. Um, and, and I think that's what's really significant about the, about the present moment. The first is, I think, um, in some ways, the actors, the, the actors from the Middle East that are now engaged in the Horn are, are a bit different. They're the same, but their relative influence is different, right? Egypt used to be a major player in the Horn, a kind of decisive actor. Uh, that has changed in many ways. Turkey. Qatar, the UAE, uh, I don't want to say they're new kids on the block, but, but certainly uh, they don't sort of have the historic pattern of, of influence, uh, at least in the post-colonial period that they do today. Saudi Arabia, of course, is by, by virtue of geography a, a big player. So the, so the actors have changed, and that matters in part because of the, the interests are different, right? I mean, Egypt's engagement in the Horn has been guided, of course, by their concerns over the Nile. That's always been the case. The interests of the actors, the decisive actors in, in the Horn today, the Turkey from the Gulf, but Turkey as well, I mean, the, the interests are more diffuse, but also the, 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 the tactics that they use to compete are also different, right? The kind of checkbook diplomacy that we see, uh, see today in the Horn, it's not new, but certainly the intensi intensity of it has really been ratcheted up. So, so that's the first observation. The second observation uh, with respect to what's new is really sort of, and this has been mentioned, the, the acquisition of permanent military bases, um, it's making a lot of sort of hay in the region, uh, permanent military bases and the acquisition of, of rights to uh, really strategic commercial assets, right? Asab, Berbera, um, other, you know, Basaso, one could go on and on, right? Um, and that, that suggests, I mean, in the past, some of, the, some of this MENA engagement has been episodic. In, in fact, I would say that was the norm, right? But this suggests at least from the perspective of the region, something a little bit more long-term, a little bit more enduring, right? I think that's also important to point out. Um, the third point I would make uh, is, uh, and again, this has been alluded to, I mean, some of this engagement is not really tethered uh, to great power competition uh, in the way that it was in, in prior uh, eras, particularly during the high water mark of the Cold War. Um, so, so that's significant in part because uh, the, the politics of of um, sort of managing conflict escalation, um, averting crisis, very different. There's not a button that one can press in Washington or Moscow or, or Beijing or whatever it is to actually get, get control of these dynamics. And the fourth thing that's new about this, and this really gets to the heart of your question, is, is the African response, right? The response of horn countries uh, to this actual, this evolving dynamic. And, and here we actually see that there is a response, right? I'm not sure we could say there was a response in prior decades. It was sort of, Countries just very opportuni opportunistically simply aligned 
uh, with, with uh, one side or the other, depending on their, their, their interests. Um, so we do see now in the Horn of Africa sort of the organic emergence of a new multilateralism, right, through EGAD, which has been mentioned before, but also the African Union, to develop a common approach amongst Horn countries uh, to the spillover of, of sort of MENA rivalries into the Horn of Africa. There are, of course, many problems with multilateralism in general in the Horn. Uh, there are many problems with this particular effort. There are disputes over who should have a seat at the table, who the relevant partners of this new regionalism should be. Uh, but, it, but it is, in my view, this is an important development, that, that countries in, 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 the, in the region are actually talking about coming together and trying to address this issue. And I think that, that gets at the underlying angst. From, from the moment the Yemen crisis started um, and the spillover began to make itself more apparent, the, the widespread angst in capitals throughout the region about, about the impacts uh, of this spillover, right? Um, I mean, sometimes there's, the view has been, you sometimes hear the view that, well, countries in the region are just sort of very opportunistically sort of trying to jump on the bandwagon. But many, many key countries in the region tried to remain neutral and have remained neutral, right? Uh, and, and I think that, that underscores the real fear they see uh, of being absorbed into, this, in, into the conflicts of the Middle East, right? Um, so that's, that's sort of what I would say is sort of key points. Um, now, in terms of how is this actually sort of playing out on the ground, um, I would say that, you know, looking at patterns of conflict and cooperation in the Horn and how it's being shaped by these new dynamics, there's not really, it's not really linear, right? It's actually pretty complicated, right? Um, I think in, in, early on, so from 2015 onwards, so you had the Yemen war uh, and then the Gulf crisis, um, I, I think you could say that the spillover was um, pretty destabilizing in terms of the Horn's international relations, right? So this is a region where you have some long-running security rivalries between the region's major states, where concerns over regime survival are endemic. Um, and so you overlaid that with um, the engagement of, of actors from the Middle East whose, uh, these are not equal relationships, of course, whose capacities and capabilities are trans transformative in terms of the balance of power, and it really kind of fomented and, and worse in security dilemmas in, dilemmas in the region between the region's major states, right? And so there were moments between 2016 and 2018 when you, when you said, wow, uh, the region really could, have, could explode because of this, the, this sort of spillover, right? But, but things have changed, obviously. The, the international relations of the Horn of Africa have changed dramatically. Um, I mean, we're not out of the woods yet. There are many problems. But the Eritrea-Ethiopia peace deal has, has sort of reduced the temperature on some of those issues, right? And I think the real big question now um, in the Horn of Africa is not really about the international relations of the Horn, but the, the sort of transition and, and, politic and, and, and questions of governance within the region states, right? So we see what's happening in Ethiopia. We see what is now happening in Sudan. And as other, others have, have, have mentioned, these are, these are really um, sort of tenuous and difficult sort of processes of transition. And, and here, this is where sort of my nightmare scenario, scenarios are, right? I mean, because I mean, one concern is that, um, that a number of uh, sort of strongmen or aspiring strongmen in the region will leverage some of these external alliances, this engagement, uh, to forestall pressures from reform or the natural tendency or evolution of the region towards reform, uh, sort, of, sort of more transparent uh, and accountable systems of governance. And the other concern is that nas nascent democratization processes will basically uh, be unwound and, and basically unravel because of the kind of fragmentation uh, that's associated with sort of multiple external actors engaging in a particular domestic political milieu. So those, those are some of the concerns uh, that I think are, are, are at the forefront right now. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Well, thank you so much. And, and let, me, um, let me throw out a, a few questions uh, for, for the four of you and, and see what your thoughts are. Uh, uh, first, we talked about China um, and, and clearly uh, the fact that the BRI doesn't go to Dubai, but it goes straight up the Red Sea, um, uh, and, and growing Chinese uh, um, economic commercial interests in the region. The region, uh, the, the interest certainly of Saudi Arabia and the UAE to be a part of the BRI. China is now the UAE's largest uh, uh, trade partner. Uh, there, there have been discussions between China and the Saudis about marrying up the BRI and Vision 2030 and how those might work together. 
there is obviously interest in the Chinese of establishing uh, themselves in Djibouti and elsewhere in, um, on the African uh, uh, coast of the Red Sea. So what is, what is the impact of uh, the Chinese role and how does that help shape the, um, the responses of the various actors uh, it, it, for example, has created some tension between the UAE and the Chinese over the, uh, the uh, commercial port in, in Djibouti. So how, how are the various players trying to accommodate, deal with, confront what is an increasingly important Chinese role in, um, in the, the Red Sea? I, I can start with a couple of comments. Uh, I just have a, a few, uh, and then I'm sure others might have some comments as well. But when I was in uh, Ethiopia in December, and I think you'll appreciate this, uh, I heard two things over and over, and they were both a bit you know, funny. One, an individual said to me, uh, we have all five vetoes on our doorstep uh, now in the Horn of Africa. And I thought that was such a great painting of the picture in terms of how uh, the Horn of Africans are thinking about this. And then the other comment that was made over and over is this is the new scramble for Africa, mm. you know, which I don't love that term because it has a series of connotations, but they were using the term because it has those connotations, right? It, it's, the, it's, um, it's this idea that it's both exciting and, and also a bit uh, disconcerting at the same time. And so on China in particular, what I was told is, to your point, that there's, n there's a nervousness about the Gulf because it's ATM diplomacy. And maybe there isn't really a real building of a relationship. If you do make a deal with the Emiratis, do you actually get a relationship out of that, or are we just trading money? But the concern with China is blackmail. So Ethiopia's bilateral trade debt is something like $15 billion with China. And of course, they're watching very closely what China did with Sri Lanka. Um, and in other cases. Uh, and so this idea of sort of being blackmailed by China was a concern. And then the concern for the US was, well, the US isn't gonna come in anyway. The US doesn't like the regulatory environments in these parts of the world and this and that. I mean, you know, Etoslot's gonna go into Ethiopia before um, Verizon, right? So, so uh, it, it was actually a US diplomat who said to me, um, uh, the US, what was it? It was something like the US likes, um, uh, to complain but not compete or something like that. But the idea that, that we just, we, we aren't really competitive there. And so their, their point was, you know, we're, we can have ATM diplomacy or we can have, you know, the blackmailing Chinese. And they're, you know, that was sort of the tone of the conversation. Uh, although it was also the, the other side of the coin is we love the fact that we're being fought over in a sense and that we can, we can have choices about the partners that we, um, that we have, and so I'm sure Michael can say more about that, but I just, to your list of things where China is involved, you, excellent list, you, you um, hit all of the, the major ones. I think, you know, as the U.S., as U.S. and other international investment has pulled out of NEOM because of the Khashoggi incident and everything, uh, of course, it may be going back, but there's a lot of Chinese investment now in NEOM, which is quite interesting. Of course, they're also in Dukum and Oman, and then the, the one last little piece I would add is that the Saudis have agreed to offer Chinese as a language in their schools. So this is a long-term plan. This is not a, you know, next year everybody's going to speak Chinese, but in, you know, 15 years some will. Um, there's some Emirati princes who already, or sheikhs, who already do. Uh, the kids of, you know, the, some royals, I should say, that already do. So there is a movement. There's, there's a lot. Yeah, China is yeah. a player. Interesting. Yes, um, me? And then, I just and then. Um, have a, a, a comment on this and on something that was said earlier. So on the, on the, um, uh, on the Chinese uh, BRI initiative, and of course, um, especially uh, someone mentioned, um, especially in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, so what, what I was doing, this is an, an ongoing research for me. Um, and actually, um, one of the interviews I made, I, an official told me that um, the reason why uh, some countries in Europe, but also um, probably maybe the US, is not really the US government and not think tanks, is not giving a big importance to what the Gulf is doing in the Horn of Africa and, and including Ethiopia. It's because 
Ethiopia and other countries are facing problems because of the debt with China, and that the new prime minister of Ethiopia is looking for an, a more liberal model. And uh, since European and US uh, companies are not, and countries are not willing or um, ready to give this money, then it's okay to let Gulf money start and try and let's see what how it's going to happen. And um, so it is also, um, this Chinese presence it is directly, I think, monitored, as well as its interaction with the Gulf by the bigger uh, powers that were traditionally and historically present um, in, in this region. Um, um, also, um, when you talk about the Chinese and the Horn, it is true that um, even though uh, they create this debt problem, Again, they are offering something different from what Gulf countries are offering. Uh, of course, they offer the debt, but they, they also offer infrastructure and investments. Now, of course, the, the problem is that um, a lot of countries are saying yes, but the Chinese come with their own workers. They come with their own uh, camps. They do not develop the skills of the citizens, of the workers involved, uh, but they do develop the infrastructure. Right, and they do leave it there, which creates the debt problem. But um, in the case of a lot of Gulf countries, these investments are not that big, and they do not necessarily have the same impact uh, on the infrastructure. Now, um, I just had another comment about an actor that, um, actually, I was supposed to, to be the one mentioning in my first uh, presentation, which is um, Iran. I mean, um, Saudi Arabia's presence in the, the Horn, uh, if you're going to think about the historical presence, you're going to think about the Israeli-Arab conflict, uh, the competition with uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser and the creation of you know, an Islamic Ummah to face the Arab-African uh, nation, but then also 1979 and the starting of spread of Shiism Shia in Sub-Saharan Africa in general, especially Iranian presence in Sudan and in Eritrea. I, and I, I wanted to, to follow up on that. I, first, let me ask Michael if he wants to uh, add. But. Yeah, very quickly, just on, yeah. on China, I think it's also important to think about uh, the ways in which kind of these sort of bottom-up sort of processes of transition in the Horn are also shaping the strategic incentives of these, of these big, big actors like China. And I think one thing, so China's position in Ethiopia is really quite interesting because um, under the previous administration, of course, it was maybe it was a counterterrorism partner of the United States. This has been alluded to earlier, previous panels. But but certainly that administration ideologically saw itself as as, as aligned with China. It was inspired in many ways by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but but Abi's rise, I think, has has changed things a bit. And and the the West, right, the United States, the Europeans have really come in in a strong way to backstop Abi in part because they see him as sort of the classic liberal reformer. That's, that's their view. Um, and China certainly, I think, sees its position somewhat threatened in Ethiopia, even though it is hardwired into Ethiopia's economic system in ways that really can't be changed. Uh, but what they have done, I mean, prior to the transition, uh, they were in negotiations with the Ethiopian government about debt and sort of renegotiating debt terms. They're really quite firm, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now that Abdi has come to power, they've become a little bit lenient. Some of, some of the debt has been renegotiated. The terms have been changed so that they're more fav favorable uh, to the Ethiopian government. And, and I think, in part, that's about the strategic calculus and sort of dealing with the politics of transition and what, what is really the center of gravity in the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia. Okay. Thanks. And, and, and to follow up, uh, I think that, that the Iranian angle is, is um, extremely interesting. The, um, the Iranians were competing for influence in, in the Horn. Uh, they did have actually a very close relationship with Sudan uh, and uh, were able to use um, their access to uh, Sudan as a transshipment point for weapons going to Hamas, among other things. The, um, the Saudis successfully wooed uh, the Sudanese away from Iran and, and uh, built a closer relationship uh, themselves. But now with the upheaval, uh, the, the Saudi relationship was very heavily contingent on their links to Bashar, uh, uh, Bashir. Uh, and uh, now with the upheaval in Sudan, there's some indication, some signs that perhaps the Iranians see this as an opportunity to try to get back to Sudan. Uh, and so um, is that something that is, uh, is driving uh, concerns in, in the Gulf? How do, uh, how do the, uh, the, the people in the Horn of Africa see, um, see the Iranian role here? Okay, I can start. Uh, well, of course, Iran has um, 
I mean, a long presence, as I said, since the early 1980s, especially in, in terms of competition with Saudi Arabia in the, the religious arena, but also, as you said, for the use of, of the Red Sea, mm -hmm. but also of the horn and the flow of arms and technical supports and trading to its allies everywhere. And now we're seeing it since 2015 with Yemen, for example. Uh, but, um, and one, to me, one of the interesting cases when I was uh, learning about this subject was actually Eritrea that was able to have, you know, both the Iranians and the Israelis, you know, have maintained uh, relations, uh, to maintain relations with them. Uh, a lot of them, uh, Saudi, and uh, I, if I dare say, we see the UAE fear of, of the Iranian presence today is also linked to the retreat of Egypt that uh, Michael has talked about. I mean, since 2011, Egypt has been, between 2011 and 2013, there was a lot of instability in Egypt and then there um, and, and Egypt was really to those countries the face of the intervention uh, in sub-Saharan Africa in general because of its weight on the African continent because because it has tools other than money so the Gulf usually gave the money to Egypt and Egypt used that in its diplomacy in sub-Saharan Africa now, since 2011, Egypt um, has been unstable for two years and then came the Muslim Brotherhood that uh, had ties and continue to have relations with Iran. And then since 2013, Egypt has been consumed a lot with its domestic problems, very hesitated to uh, intervene heavily uh, regionally just for influence. Egypt's actions in the Horn of Africa are directly linked to its domestic security concerns. And this is why we saw that Egyptian participation in the campaign on Yemen, for example, was very clearly defined that it was to protect the freedom of maritime circulation in, in Bab al-Mandab, and, and that's it. Uh, and uh, this is why maybe the UAE and Saudi Arabia with the money felt the need to come explicitly and to intervene explicitly without really counting on Egypt, especially that another, um, it, that 2011 saw the demise of another major Arab African power that was used directly or relied on indirectly by the Gulf countries, especially in the fight against Iran, which is Qaddafi. Qaddafi has always had, you know, very complex relations with the Gulf countries, especially with Saudi Arabia, but he had something against, you know, uh, Iran and Iran Iran's uh, activism in sub-Saharan Africa. And believe it or not, even in, in, at times, uh, of course, he used this against Gulf countries, but at other times, actually, uh, it served their interests. Now, when you saw those Mubarak and Qaddafi falling and the instability that occurred, and then the retreat in the Egyptian role, those countries felt the need, the absolute necessity to come back to more interventionism. Uh, I'd also like to point that if you look at the Saudi regional policy today, it's really a policy where Saudi Arabia is trying to formalize regional commitments to its security and to the implementation of foreign policy goals that really Saudi cannot implement on its own. If you look at um, the coalitions that have been created since 2016, the Islamic coalition to defeat Daesh, that is really just merely a facade to say, we're not alone, we have other countries with us. Uh, of course, the coalition in Yemen, which ended up really relying just on Saudi Arabia and the UAE and other African troops, but also mercenaries, uh, sadly enough. If you look at a project of a Middle East strategic alliance that was suggested by the US, but it's really the Saudis really are pushing for it, and the Red Sea Initiative. There is really a tendency to formalize you know, the, the commitments to the regional uh, security. Uh, and you mentioned Sudan and Iran be seeing an opportunity to come back to Sudan. Um, now, I see this as being very difficult uh, where we are today, because uh, it would face not only uh, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates with all the money they have been using, but it will also face Egypt. And if we talk about the retreat of Egypt in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Horn in terms of projection of influence, Sudan is different. Sudan is not about projecting influence. Sudan is really merely national security. I mean, for the Egyptian establishment and for a long time also in the Gulf, let's remember that relations with the Horn were mainly security relations. It was first and foremost the intelligence services conducting those relations. Sudan remains in this category of national security and I don't think that in Sudan or in Libya for that matter, the Egyptians will let go easily of any intervention that could, could harm in any way their interest and they are very much supported in this by the Emiratis and the Saudis that see a genuine uh, interest in the stability of the Sisi regime. Uh, one final just anecdote is that when we mentioned the Nile a lot for Egypt, mm -hmm. 
every regional power in, 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 in the, from the powers we're talking about right now, uh, even those who have close relations with Egypt, if in moments of tension, they have all used the Nile against Egypt. So Turkey, of course, is using Ethiopia against Egypt. Uh, the Israelis, the Egyptians, you know, I've always been sending those reports about the Israeli cooperation uh, on the Renaissance Dam. The Qataris uh, are also reported to have done so. When Egypt and Saudi Arabia had tensions, you saw someone from the royal court going just visiting, you know, the, the Renaissance Dam. So every single person who wanted to really uh, put pressure on Egypt have, has used Ethiopia and has used the Nile question uh, against yeah. it. Yeah. Michael, yeah. So very quickly on, on the question of Iran, I, I don't think uh, an Iranian comeback uh, in the Horn of Africa is likely uh, anytime soon. I think one of the most successful aspects, and again, you alluded to this, of Saudi and Emirati policy in the Horn since 2015 has been their ability uh, to kind of diminish Iranian influence in the region. Um, Obviously, they've been much less successful with Qatar and Turkey. Uh, and part of the reason is that outside of Sudan, uh, Bashir Sudan, Iran really didn't have uh, uh, much strategic influence in the region, right? Mm -hmm. And so the critical juncture, I think, was in 2016 after uh, the Saudi mission in Tehran was torched. And at that point, uh, most countries in the Horn basically broke relations with Iran. And I don't think they've been re rehabilitated. Um, and I think countries in the region recognize relations with Iran as kind of a red line uh, that they, they should not cross. I think that, okay. is, that is a consensus view. Okay, so uh, following up on that, uh, the, the Turkey Qatar versus, um, versus Saudi Emirati um, uh, competition. Uh, uh, Ganul uh, mentioned the, the, the idea that the Turks somehow would like to mediate between Somaliland and, um, and Somalia. We heard on the first panel that Somalia perhaps is uh, one of the more optimistic um, spots in the, in the horn, that, that things seem to be moving in a positive direction. To the extent that there is interest in Somalia, Somaliland, Puntland, um, working together, resolving some of their differences, we have the Emiratis developing the, uh, the port in Berbera, uh, the Turks remain uh, very significant in terms of uh, roles and, and responsibilities in Mogadishu and Somalia. Uh, to what extent do you um, see these uh, competitions as being impediments to further progress in Somalia, further normalization of the situation in Somalia? Genul? Well, I think um, I first want to add something on the Iran question, whether Turkey would be concerned about the Iranian role in Sudan. I think Turkey is already uh, it's, it's, it's very much worried about what will happen uh, to Sudan in the post-coup uh, era because Turkey uh, invested heavily in the old guard. Um, and I think Turkey wanted Sudan to be a, a success case of of its African engagement. So if you look at what uh, Swakin, what Turkey is doing on the Swakin Island, uh, I mean, it's, it's planning to open a military base on the one hand, but it's trying to uh, restart the, the start uh, ferries to the holy sites, and it's restoring Ottoman era buildings. So it's all, it's this, this Turkey's bigger vision. Uh, for, for Africa. So what's happening in Sudan is, is very important to Turkey. And I think Iran is, at this point, less of a concern. I think it, Turkey would be more worried of, uh, uh, over an increasing uh, Saudi uh, role there. And when it comes to Somalia, can Turkey play uh, a constructive role? I think so far, uh, Turkey's uh, Somalia policy has been the most successful. Uh, and mainly because it was received very well by, by uh, locals. Um, and again, I think Somalia was a test case of Turkey using uh, religion as, uh, as a tool, uh, soft power tool. Um, so Turkey is, Turkish civil society organizations, uh, Turkish NGOs, and Turkey's uh, official development aid agency, they are all there. Uh, they are very active on the ground, and they have, I think, established uh, close partnerships that 
paved the way for a mili closer military cooperation. But as I said earlier, I think there's, there's limit, there's, there are limits to what Turkey can do in that region, mainly because Turkey is domestically now, uh, I mean, I, I hear this very often. I was at an event last week about Gulf and how the Gulf countries see Turkey as a rising near Ottoman uh, actor. That's not how I see uh, today's Turkey. It's become a very vulnerable country. Domestically, there is a lot of instability. Uh, and also, uh, of course, a bigger problem is, is Turkey's economic problems. So I think that's why um, Turkey cannot be an active, uh, constructive actor in, uh, in the region in general, but particularly in the Horn of Africa, which is a place that's not uh, a, the top priority for, for Turkey's foreign policy. Okay. Yeah, Michael. Oh, first. <laughs> so on the, 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 the particular challenges in Somalia and, and the role that Turkey and other MENA countries might play in bridging the divide, I mean, this, the, this, again, we've talked about this, but the, the central issue in Somalia is the relationship, is, is the federalism project, right? The relationship between uh, the federal government of Somalia and Mogadishu and then the regional states, uh, and then, of course, the relationship between Somalia and, and Somaliland. Um, and, and the problem of al-Shabaab really emanates from that political issue. Now, now can MENA countries play a role in, in, in bringing the federalism project together? I'll, I'll make the controversial argument that they probably can't, right? And we need to think about a whole different range of actors to be involved, in part because none of the MENA countries are, are, are perceived as neutral in the Somali context, right? Uh, Turkey's, Turkey's model in Somalia has had a lot of very positive impacts, but they're seen as very close to Mogadishu, right? The UAE and the Saudis are seen as, as particularly the UAE is seen as quite close uh, to Somaliland and the federal member states, right? Um, Qatar is, is seen as, as being quite close to the, to the, to, to the government of Mogadishu. So this, this is the problem. They've already been absorbed into the politics of competition in the Somali context. Um, so so th maybe that's somewhat of a, a negative view, but that's sort of the way, the way I see it. Okay, Irene? Um, I would just add that uh, when I was there recently, as I mentioned. This came up a lot. The, the fear was, Iran came up not at all, but the concerns among these groups of African officials was very much that the, the Gulf Rift was going to destabilize the region, just as you were saying in your opening comments that you know, this idea that the problems of the Middle East somehow end up coming and affecting the Horn of Africa. Um, and. Uh, I think one of the issues, I mean, if we could solve the rift, that would solve a lot of these, these problems, but I don't uh, see that happening anytime soon, unfortunately. I was just recently in the UAE and Qatar, and I don't get the sense that either side is going to back down uh, anytime soon. Um, and you know, as a result, I think the Horn of Africa countries do have to think about how to sort of manage the problem as opposed to um, being hopeful that it's going to end. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to open it up uh, to the floor for, for your questions in a moment. So if you want to uh, come, we have uh, microphones on either side. And, and if you would just uh, come. And while we're waiting for people uh, to do that, one last question. And that is, we haven't really talked about the significance of, of the, the states in the Horn, especially Sudan, perhaps. Um, in terms of uh, agricultural uh, autarky in, in the Gulf, um, uh, a, a huge swaths of, of agricultural land being uh, purchased uh, by, uh, by uh, Gulf agricultural interests. How does that play out in the future? Uh, you know, how, how do these uh, states see the role uh, of these uh, large agricultural investments uh, in terms of their own security? And, and also, um, how, uh, how does it appear to people in the region? I think that there's been some controversy, really, about, about the significance of selling, uh, selling agricultural land. So, um, uh, Yasmin, Elena, Michael? So, um, yeah. Yeah. so I'll just say a couple of comments. So the idea about the Horn of Africa, or Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in general, honestly, being the breadbasket of the uh, Gulf, 
goes back really to the 1970s. And it's in the 1970s, several uh, you know, development funds and several um, institutions were developed to, to channel you know, Gulf money and you know, um, invest in the agriculture for food security, especially for Gulf countries. This resulted in the first Arab-African summit in 1977. Now, do you know when did the second summit about this took place? In 2010. You know, and, and to me, it, well, it has been regular ever since, and um, it's really um, remarkable that it has been taking place between uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, the Gulf countries. So it took place in Kuwait in, in November this year. It's going to take place in Saudi Arabia, and then Saudi Arabia before the Arab African summit is going to have its own summit yeah. with the African countries. It has, of course, as we know, since a year now, its own special envoy. The idea of, um, again, of this uh, basket or this food security coming from the Gulf came up again during the food crisis in 2008 and 2000, until 2010. Uh, and really since then, uh, I mean, Ilana would know better, but I think UE investments in that, I think quite quadrupled in this regard. Mm. Uh, but g the Horn countries are still not the main supplier of food or agriculture, and correct me if I'm wrong, to the Gulf countries, not yet. And still there is the question whether this is linked really to the importance, the strategic importance that, that those uh, countries are gaining in the calculations. Will it last? Will it not last for the time being? Still, they are not, I think, as high as the planned investments were hoped to be. Um, uh, I think this is, this is what I have to say. I, I would just add that I think the Gulf countries are also wanting to move away from, you know, this has always been a plan B. And I think they'd love to make it a plan C if possible. Uh, they'd love to have their own technology to grow their own food in country. Whether that's you know, possible or not is a whole open question, but they're trying things like vertical farming and all these sorts of things to try to see if they can technologically fix this problem instead of having to rely on anyone. And Qatar, of course, has learned this lesson better than anybody that relying on you know, one country, i.e. Saudi, for milk was not a particularly good idea uh, given what happened. And so now they're diversifying resources so, uh, and trying to do a lot of things domestically. I think they have more cows now than they've ever had um, <laughs> so that they can domestically uh, get their own milk. So yeah, so I think the Gulf would love to move away from this. Whether they'll succeed or not is another, another question. Yeah. yeah, just to, not a lot to add, just to say that, um, you know, that, these, this isn't just an issue of, of sort of selling, the selling of, of, of land in Sudan, particularly Ethiopia, uh, to, to countries in the Gulf. I mean, this is a broader issue, China, India, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, but, but this is a, a potent political issue in many of these countries. And one can't really understand the kind of protest movements that have bubbled up both in Ethiopia and Sudan without understanding uh, sort of how the selling of uh, of land uh, to uh, for the purposes of, of, of foreign for to foreign investors uh, who use it for commercial purposes that that hasn't right. played particularly well in each of these countries. So th that particular issue has to be reconciled politically. And it's not even clear to me it's sustainable from the perspective of these particular countries' political economies. Good. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let me uh, turn uh, to our to our audience, and if you want to identify yourself and ask your question, please. My name is Li Yang. Thanks for the panelist. Uh, just wonder if you can address the issues from social background, educational background. How do you develop their characteristic, whether they will be toward communism or toward capitalism, and whether the, the, the Bell Initiative, Bell Law Initiative, would be follow or collaborate with Turkey. They work together along the build law, hmm. the, the, the design, or they will be independent. And uh, currently, I'm most important is uh, I think decades ago, when Africa tried to develop, but uh, even the United States, they protest in the uh, IMF and the World Bank because they say that's only profit over people, that's only enrich some wealthy people or their, <laughs> their major political player rather than benefit the people because people, they don't even have water. They have to wait for drip, drip, drip the water. So at the time, the protest is very significant. 
And then later on, now uh, we are having even in the United States the PPP public private partnership. This has been propaganda across the United States, almost any every government agencies. It is already uh, evidence as a significant, very serious uh, fraudulent criminal network operation, including not just a government official misconduct abuse, but they co cooperate with the private sector, the fraud and crime, with all kind of murder. So I just wonder if you can address these issues, not, not let them do it themselves in the wrong way. What I mean is unjust influence by maybe profit over people. So, so the question would be um, how, how should these uh, societies in the, in the Horn of Africa develop what should be their model of development? What would be the role of the Belt and Road Initiative in promoting development? Is that is that correct? This is the first. The second is really the, the way they develop, try to see whether they try to make investment. I mean, the world helps wealthy people is a lot. They can invest, they can uh, have a charity. They don't need a government to subsidize or cooperate together like PPP. You don't need that. What I mean is, there are a lot of wealthy people, they can do it, but they don't, I, I don't want them to use the government to rob government or taxpayers' money. Right, so, so the, the second question would be uh, the role of the private sector in, uh, in helping these societies develop so. rather than relying on, um, on government uh, assistance programs. Yeah, and whether the education can develop the people's uh, integrity and accountability. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Michael? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll sort of... Very, very horny. <laughs> so I'll, 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 maybe I'll sidestep the substance of that question and just talk maybe a little bit more big, big picture about what I think needs to happen uh, in the Horn of Africa in terms of governance. Uh, and I think uh, we're sort of at a critical juncture in the region, uh, given the transition uh, in Ethiopia and also Sudan. Uh, and the fundamental question, I think, is what is the new equilibrium in terms of governance? Like, where does, where does the dust settle? And do we, do we get more stable, accountable, uh, transparent governments than, than we had before, right? One cannot understand patterns of crisis, conflict, underdevelopment in the Horn without understanding uh, the nature of governance and its, govern and its governments, right? Um, uh, personalistic, uh, corrupt, um, Oftentimes, they externalize their own domestic insecurities into the broader region, right? So, so we've got to get to the root of the problem, and that is fundamentally new domestic political settlements. Um, and I think what's happened in Ethiopia, and I'd echo some of the optimism, is really critical, right? Because none of these countries in the Horn exist in a vacuum, and that will naturally spill over uh, into the neighborhood. And I think the, the, the fundamental project should be to consolidate some of the gains in Ethiopia, or perhaps into Sudan, where we've actually seen spillover, uh, and then organically, uh, hopefully, it'll, it'll, it'll go into the broader region. But, but the point I had made earlier uh, is quite essential, that the, the natural evolution we're now seeing could be thwarted by uh, the new politics of extroversion and some of the external influence that we're seeing. And that's, 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 a, that's, a, uh, that's something that concerns me. And, and for external actors like the United States, I think there needs to be far more attention on this particular issue, right? The nexus of of sort of uh, Middle East, Horn of Africa engagement, how, how the United States might run some interference to prevent some of the more negative, the more negative spillover in terms of actual governance, right? Well, and, and, and to follow up on that and to kind of bring it um, uh, back a little bit uh, towards the, the uh, broader panel discussion, to what extent are these societies emphasizing the, 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 the growth of uh, strong private sector uh, institutions in their in their societies, and to what extent does the engagement by the Gulf states, by uh, by the others, either help or or, um, uh, or oppose uh, that kind of development? One thing that I can throw out, and then maybe Michael can uh, give us the context for, but. Um, the UAE is doing a housing project that's a pretty major project in Addis Ababa. Um, and uh, they also told me that the telecom network is finally being allowed to go to the private sector. So they're, you know, 
companies are going to come in and develop the, the telecom network. And I think that these sorts of movements are good you know, for governance. I, I, I don't know if the, the problem with the UAE project is that the housing is relatively fancy housing right in the middle of Addis. And so that's going to you know, please some people and not please, I mean, it's Solidaire in Beirut. It's, you know, all these, we've had these examples before where there's two sides to the, to the equation and how that works out politically, I, I don't know. But um, I was very interested in the fact that the telecom network was all of a sudden going to open up and allow private sector to come in. I think that's a difference mm -hmm. under Abi, right? Mm -hmm. So those sorts of things, as they happen, you know, um, over time, it changes the economy. For good or for ill, we'll see, but, but it certainly changes it. Great. There was also a question about the Turkish-Chinese investment within the framework of, of the BR, uh, BRI. I think, well, China has become an important, alter Chinese investment has become an important alternative to, to um, Western investments in, in Turkey. At a time when Turkey is having uh, many problems with with uh, with the European Union, which is uh, Turkey's biggest trading partner, and also the Gulf investment, uh, which has become critical, particularly under under this party, the ruling AKP, is now uh, facing challenges. Just today, uh, Saudi Chamber of Commerce asked uh, Saudi inv investors not to invest in Turkey. So, uh, so this is a critical time for Turkish economy and that's why I think Turkey is, is, is sees China and the BRI as an important alternative because it's uh, no strings attached. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why Turkey has, kept, has been uh, mute on what China has been doing to Uyghurs and wh why Turkey appointed a, a former businessman as its ambassador to China. So it's uh, Ch China, Turkey-China relations in that regard is seen from a, primarily from an economic uh, point of view and Turkey has been uh, trying very hard to attract investment within the framework of, of uh, BRI, uh, but I don't know whether it's going to go anywhere. Okay, great. Yasmin, last I, word. I just have a, a last comment about the development of private sector that also links to what Elena said about what uh, the UAE is doing in Ethiopia. Now, just yesterday, uh, you know, the State Minister of Foreign Affairs, Anwar Gargash, you know, was um, again uh, using an argument that the UAE always uses to really counter uh, the debate about the, the risk of its interventions in the region, whether they are aware in sub Saharan Africa, saying that we have uh, an exemplary model of economic governance uh, in our country, which is true. I mean, the success is, the way is very real. But the problem is that what the people see in, in the UE external intervention is really political intervention that doesn't arrive to, 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 to the uh, to, to the stage of exporting this economic governance. Now, maybe it's just that the countries where the UAE intervened never wanted it. They just wanted the UAE political intervention, and then they said, okay, th that's it, and you're out. Or maybe it was not the case, and maybe this is why, you know, referring to Elena's uh, first comment, why people freak out, you know, when they see that the UAE is on all the, the, the ports around the Red Sea, which is actually not fair because the development of ports in Sub-Saharan Africa from the UAE has started even before that yeah. elsewhere. You have it in Senegal, you have it in Algeria, even before 2011. But the problem is that when you take the examples of UAE interventions in Yemen, in Egypt, now in Libya, in Sudan, you don't see an export of this successful economic governance. All you see is the political. Right, right. Well, with that, uh, please join me in thanking our outstanding panel, Michael Waldemariam, <laughs> Elena DeRozier, Gunol Tol, and Yasmin Farouk. Uh, I want to, uh, before I close, I want to uh, thank again Garter World for uh, their support for this conference and also to extend our thanks to the MEI interns uh, that were instrumental to its success, Riley Polka, Martin Gilbert, and Yara Misto. And thanks to all of you for uh, coming and uh, spending this time with us. Thank you.